Good morning, delegates, judges, coaches, parents, and dedicated fans. My name is Prime Jamaica. And I'm Lois Coldwell. Over the last two days, we have witnessed intense competition by the best public speakers our collective schools have to offer, leading to tight deliberations by our honored judges. This morning, we are gathered to here to attend performances by the very best of the best. The first event to be held this morning will be impromptu speaking. Impromptu is a forensic speaking category in which a speaker has one minute to prepare a three to five minute speech on one of the two topics provided. Once again, please remember exiting the theater will not be permitted for the duration of this, this event. Now please join me in welcoming our lovely time musicians who will run the speaking order. Sit back and enjoy. No contestant should be in the room at this time except the first speaker. Uh, once the round has begun, only coaches and administrators in charge with a proper ID will be permitted to exit the room. Audience members must remain in the room until the round has ended. If you feel you may need to leave before the round is done, please consider slipping out now before we begin. There are to be no photographs, tape recordings, or videos to, uh, to be taken during the speeches, and please turn off any phones, beepers, pages, and watch alarms now. I'd also like to remind you that there is to be no texting during the entire run. Thank you. There is this movie, Kung Fu Panda. Now, Master Shifu, brilliant, brilliant man. He says to Poe, Poe, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That is why it is called the present. Now, at first, when I heard this advice, I'm like, He's a cool voice. You know, I don't really pay attention to what the words mean. But you know, the more I think about this quote, the more I think about what he said, I realize the present is what you have to look towards. The present is what matters. Yes, we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And yes, yesterday is in the past. But today, the moments we've lived, the experiences we have, the times we share, that's what matters. The present is literally a present. Now, um, you don't only see this in, you know, animated movies. No, you can look to other places to see this. In history today, Japan and China are, in, are currently in a very serious conflict with many islands. The conflict is Japan is trying to lay claim to islands that should rightly belong to Ch Japan is trying to lay claim to islands that belong to China. Now, this is a serious problem for many reasons because in the past, Japan and China have not exactly been on the best diplomatic terms. With the rape of Nanking, China is still very bitter with Japan. The problems and the scars that were left from this rape, they still hurt China deeply. Now, China has no reason to forgive Japan because Japan is stuck in the past. Japan is so concerned with this reputation. Japan is about honor. In the Japanese mind, they try to, white, they try to whitewash this rape. It never happened. Comfort women don't exist. They did not massacre 200,000 people. None of this happened. They are so concerned with this image. They are so concerned with whitewashing the past. They are so concerned with what people will think about them that they ignore the present. And that is causing problems for them today. The, dip the diplomatic problems, yeah, they can be solved. Sit down, have a nice meeting, share a cup of coffee. But no, they won't be solved because Japan is stuck in the past. They refuse to look at the present, which is what matters. If they stuck to the present, they admitted their fault in the past, everyone makes mistakes, then they could take care of today's problems because the present is what matters. Now, I'm a baseball player and I'm not a very good one, but I made the Seabus team last year. And my very first at bat of the tournament, very first at bat, struck out. What a way to start, you know? But the thing is, I let that get to me. My second at bat, when they put me in, when my team needed me, when it came down to beating Bangkok, my biggest rival, do not like people from there, kidding, kidding. But when it came down to that, when it came down to that moment, I chose. I could not get out of my mind the previous round. I could not get out of my mind that last that bad. That stuck in my mind, and it got me. It took control of the present. That one at bat ruined the present, which is what really mattered. It was six, seven, I could have taken them. I could have done it, but the past blocked me. 
If I focused on the present, erase what happened in the past, just like my coach told me, I may have gotten a hit. I may have gotten my team the win that it needed. The present is what matters, not the past. The final example can be seen in the literary novel, The Count of Monte Cristo. Now, in this book, The Count of Monte Cristo is on a quest for revenge. That is his whole plan. All he is concerned about is getting revenge on the people that ruined his life. But is that what is important? Is that what he should have been doing? Yes, people ruined his life, but what happened has happened. You have no control over the past, it's gone. It is what it is. You gotta look to the future. It is the present day. That is what matters. But the Count didn't realize this, no. He ruined his whole life because he was constantly looking for that quest for revenge. He wanted to get back to these people that ruined him. That is not what he should have done. He should have made amends with the past. The present is what matters. The present is what you must look for to. Now, I cannot say that Kung Fu Panda hasn't changed my life, because I know Master Shifu's words will be with me forever. But maybe the next time I'm having a baseball game, or when we're in class talking about this Japan conflict, I can bring up the point. The present is what matters. Just like Master Shifu told me. Thank you. Four minutes, 46 seconds. Time. One day, I wish my parents could understand that only the present matters. See, whenever I get a bad grade, it doesn't matter how many A's I've had in the past. Because my parents look at the F or the D and say, Justin, this is unacceptable. How can you be doing this now? See, they don't look at the past. They think only the present matters, and I have a massive issue with this. It's when we only focus on the present, we lose track of everything else in the process. And I believe this can be illustrated through three primary examples. So firstly, we can see this through literature, second, in our daily societal issues, and finally, right here, right now, in our daily lives. So to the first point, literature. In the book Stalling for Time, written by Gary Nosner, the FBI chief hostage negotiator, Gary talks about what it's like to quite literally hold other people's lives in your hands. See, Gary figures out that it's only the present that can concern him. He can't look back to past failures, or else he loses track of himself, his goals, and what he has to do as a hostage negotiator. In a particular case in Waco, Texas, a man, David Koresh, has gotten a cult following of over 70 people. He holds them hostage in a compound, and Gary tries as hard as he can to get these people out, to save them. He focuses only on the present, does not look towards his past experience, tries to attune what he does to now. And because of that, he plays ignorant and blind to certain issues. And ultimately, all 73 of those hostages ended up burning themselves alive in Waco, Texas. So obviously, this is an issue with one of the most dire consequences, mass suicide. But see, the effects are far more subtle in our own lives, and especially in specific societal issues. Which brings me to my second point. In the recent decade, we thought Gathering food resources would be the best choice for our community. After all, if governments wanted to guarantee the health of their citizens, what could be better than a stable food base? But then things started to quite literally tip the other way, as obesity became a growing problem in many first world nations. See, because we tried to rely only on the past, what we'd known from before, we weren't able to face now, the present. And because of relying back, on what we've done before, we have a major problem where over 35.6 people in the America, percent, sorry, are obese. See, the gravity of the issue, if you will go along with my terrible pun, did and did, did catch us off guard because we were relying too heavily on the past. It is only the present that matters, and when we understand this, we move forward as a society. So, to the final example. Where can we see the importance of the present in our daily lives? I have a friend. His name, we'll call him Chris. And he loves to play basketball. 
So he made the JV team, and like many in my freshman year class, and he loved to play sports. But he doesn't think he's particularly good. He shoots a hoop, thinks he makes it well, but then tries to move forth. And on one particular day, he wasn't playing so well. So he decided he would throw away the game. Suddenly my friends confronted him. He said, how can you focus just on this little drip in the present when there's been so much more in the past? How can this tiny little speck now outweigh all that came before? And he says, well, it's only now that matters. And he thought that that was his justification for being able to throw away something he was brilliant at. Now I know not all of us will overreact like Chris. But see, too often we let what happens now overcome and outweigh all that came before. And ladies and gentlemen, we cannot let this happen. So our three examples. Firstly, in memoirs. Second, in societal issues, and most importantly, in our daily lives. But ultimately, what does this whole idea teach us? That only the present matters. I hold my point that the present does matter significantly, but we can't focus on it so much that it consumes everything that came before. So, maybe you've seen me in my daily life make mistakes, but ladies and gentlemen, please focus only on the present. That is all that matters. Four minutes and 38 seconds. I am deathly afraid of insects. One time, I was sitting on the bus in first grade, and I felt a small itch on my belly. I just thought it was nothing, maybe some rash, mosquito bite, so I scratched it and I left it alone. I went to school, and I felt another itch, this time on my arm. Once again, I thought I was just unlucky with mosquitoes, so I scratched it and kept on going with my day. And then lunchtime came around. I looked at my hand, which had that same feeling, that same itch, and I saw a caterpillar slowly creeping along my hand. This frightened me out of my mind. I leapt out of my seat, I screamed, oh my god, I'm going to die. It was this caterpillar this big, but come on, I was a first grader. Give me some credit here. That slow creeping feeling that started from my stomach, that went to my arm, and finally ended up on my hand, really frightened me. And it was that gradual buildup that made that final discovery that my caterpillar, that my hand had a caterpillar on it, so frightening. Because you see, when you have a feeling that someone strikes you like a bolt of lightning, it may not be as surprising or as impactful. But when a slow, creeping feeling comes over your heart, whether it's a feeling of sadness, whether it's a feeling of despair, or whether it's a feeling of triumph and success. That is the most impactful type of feeling. Now, unfortunately, I have three grandparents. My fourth grandparent died when my mother was just eight years old. His name was Grandpa Stephen, and to this day, we still love and respect him, even though most of us in our family haven't met him. My grandmother, I call her Mama, she tells me of the time when he passed away. And she said, that night I had left the hospital thinking, you know what, he's going to come out all right. But at 2 a.m., she sat bolt upright in her bed. She was suddenly awake, and she had that slow, creeping feeling that something had gone awry. Just because her gut told her to, she rested the hospital, and the worst news occurred, that her husband had passed away. I know this is a sad story, but it does prove that that slow, creeping feeling is the most impactful. Yes, she suddenly awoke, but she didn't run to her car instantly. She might have cooked herself some omelets, she might have read her book, had that feeling slowly creeping over her that something went wrong before she did something about it. That made all the difference, and that was much more impactful than maybe a doctor calling and saying, we're sorry, but this happened. We also see this in tennis. I'm a massive tennis fan, and recently, at the 2011 Wimbledon finals, oh sorry, Wimbledon first round, we saw the longest tennis match in the world between American John Isner and Frenchman Nicolas Mahou. Now the final set went to 70-68, that's 70 plus 68 games in the fifth set alone. Can you imagine what it must have felt like to be one of them? To have that slow, creeping fatigue wash over you? 
the fingers of tiredness running from your feet to your hands, to finally your mental game where you're about to break down and collapse on the ground, but you keep on going until you win and you get through that second round. Later in the interviews, the winner, John Isner, talked about how that slow, creeping feeling of fatigue was the worst because it didn't hit him instantly. It wasn't a sudden Charlie horse or a sudden cramp, no. It was slow, and that's what almost made him lose in the end, before he suddenly hit a fantastic ace and won the game. But slow, creeping feelings don't always have to be sad. They can be feelings of success and triumph as well, and that is when you feel the best about yourself. Now, one of my greatest role models is that William Kumfamba, a small boy from Malawi, who built a windmill for his village at age 14. Now, William had dropped out of school because he couldn't even pay the tuition fee of $80 a year, unfortunately. But with just scraps from the junkyard and a manual from the library, he was able to build a windmill that powered four light bulbs and two radios for his house. Now, I know this doesn't sound very impressive, but for him, it was a major, major success. And he said in his memoir, the boy who harnessed the wind, that that slow creeping feeling of success was really what pushed him through to the end. That slow creeping feeling says, oh my god, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I've done it. That was much more gratifying than a sudden burst of, yay me, woo, victory, yay. So you see, slow creeping feelings are really what bring the emotions. Thank you. Five minutes and seven seconds. Good morning. One of the most important truths that we all have to understand is that only the present matters. And that no matter how much we wish we could change the past and change our mistakes, they have already occurred. And that instead of looking back, we must move forward in order to become better people, lest we be stuck in a vicious cycle of second guessing which can prevent us from learning from our past mistakes. We see this in three different fields, which make this fact clearly evident in our own lives. The first is in ancient myths and legends. The second is in entertainment. And finally, we see it from our greatest teacher, personal experience. Now, one of my favorite myths is the myth of the Trojan horse, which the ancient Greek author Homer describes in his epic poem, The Iliad. Now, what a lot of people don't know about the Iliad is it's not just about the moment when the Trojan horse comes into the city. The Iliad is a myth which discusses what happens 10 years into the Trojan War, in which the Greeks try to take the city of Troy because Troy has taken a Greek woman, Helen, captive. The beginning of the epic actually starts out in Book 1, where two warriors are angry. One warrior is Menelaus, the Greek king, and the second is Achilles. And both of them get in a furious fight over only one source in Greek mythology, which is, of course, the woman. And the two of them are continually fighting. And they can't seem to let their differences go. But they also realize that their soldiers are hungry and that they want to go home because the fighting must end. What the two soldiers eventually do is they put the fighting of the woman behind them in order to move forward for the greater good. And together, they corroborate with, to create a plan to besiege the city of Troy in this wooden horse, which is this massive beast stuffed with, uh, with Greek hoplites, which enters the city, and when the city is totally un unprepared, the hoplites strike and slaughter everyone inside. Now, this wasn't a happy ending for the Trojans, of course, but for the Greeks, it's important because if these two great thinkers had not put their feud aside, had let the past go, and emphasized that only the present, the objective of getting the city mattered, they would not have been able to come up with such a successful plan. But we don't just have to look to ancient myths and legends to learn that truly the present matters. We also see it in more modern entertainment, which, despite what modern critics may say, actually has quite a bit of value. Now, one of my favorite movies is The King's Speech, which features the story of King Albert, the King of Britain, in during World War II. And he has a serious problem. He has a speech impediment. He cannot seem to get a word out, no matter how he struggles. He stammers and stammers and stammers. And he knows that his family and his country are relying on him to deliver a critical message which will give the British troops confidence as they prepare to fight against the Germans. Bertie, or Prince Albert, undergoes several obstacles, 
Now, the speech impediment is a psychological problem that's fueled by a lack of confidence. None of, none of his family members, particularly his cruel father, really believe what he can do. But it's the, at the end of the day, it's not the fact that Bertie met a famous speech coach, Lionel Loeb, that let him overcome his problem. It was the fact that he recognized that he had a job to do and he had a speech to give, and he could only be successful by forgetting about his past mistakes, his past errors, and moving forward into the future. If he had not done this, if he had not recognized that only the present matters, he would have spun into a vicious cycle that would not have made him the great leader that he ended up becoming. And finally, we learn that only the present matters from our own personal experiences. And I learned this firsthand when I moved away from New York City, which was my home, where I'd lived for 14 years, to an international school, in which I was thrust into an environment that I was totally unprepared for. Not only did I not speak the language of where I was going, but moreover, I had no friends and I was a freshman entering high school, thinking, what on earth am I gonna do? And months went by and I realized that I was getting nowhere by missing home, thinking about the past, thinking about my old friends. It was time to open up and meet some new people. Now, if I hadn't realized that my past in New York was totally behind me and that I was gonna miss my favorite delis, but I couldn't get them back anyways because I was already gone, I wouldn't have been able to embrace the international school experience, to meet all of the new friends, and to learn all of the new cultural values which have defined me as a person. And I learned from this personal experience that although the past seems to matter, what's fundamentally important is that we recognize the importance of moving into the future. So, whether we learn it from ancient myths which have defined centuries of literature after them, from our favorite movies, or even from personal experience, we have to recognize that only the present matters. The past is gone, and if we spend too much time focusing on it, thinking about our mistakes, we can never move forward to the future to become better people. Thank you.
All he could think about was the past four years that his mother had been battling this cancer, battling this disease. And as he was mourning, and as I was trying to do my best that I could to comfort him, all I could think is that only the present matters, and that now we have to move on. What your mother has done and what she did in the battle, we must appreciate that and respect that, but now move on and live the life that she wants you to live. She wants you to do sports. She wants you to participate. She wants you to do well in school and to have friends. She doesn't want you to close off. And that now it's the present that matters, not the past, not the hardships that you went through. Focus on the present, because that is only what matters, and that is what she would want him to do. We can also see in my favorite book of mine that I actually chose to read for pleasure this time, not like my history textbooks, that the novel Perfume by Patrick Susskind. Now this is an example of how he let the past, his past actions, affect what he was going to do in the future. Now this paints a tale of Bren Wheat, this, uh, not part of my French, um, this sinister man living in Paris who has the best nose of all France. Now, in this story, what we see happening is that he murders this young girl when he's just about 12 years old because she's a virgin and she has this pure scent that he just must have for himself. Now, he moves on, he gathers her hand, he smells it, he does nothing with it, he just smells her, and then he moves on. I know, it's quite an interesting novel. He moves on, and he becomes, he studies perfumery by the master Balandini, and in his perfumery study, he realizes all the sense, but he let this past of killing this girl haunt him. And what he did was he continued to search for the smell. He didn't focus on the present and how he could have been a famous perfumer, making millions of dollars with perfectly normal ways of scent. Instead, he let what he, his actions of the past and didn't focus, realize that it was only the present that matters. And he started killing 24 virgins just so that he can contain their smell and make the most beautiful scent in all of Paris. Not to sell it to anyone, not to make any money, but just to have this smell. Now, if he hadn't been focused on the past, perhaps he would have realized that this is not the way to go, and then in the present, he could have made millions of dollars. So, next time your history teacher tries to convince you to do the next reading, read ahead, study harder, just roll your eyes at them and say, really, is that what matters? Isn't it what I do on the test, not the studying, not what happens back behind the back? It's what you do now. It's what action you take and initiative. That's what really matters. It's the present that is the only thing that matters, not your actions of the past. Four minutes and 53 seconds. Time. I would like you all to imagine a tall, buff Indian man <laughs> checking his email at 6.14 a.m. December 14, 2012. Harvard admissions results. You are deferred. Thank you. That's great. Great news. Actually, no. They deferred my dreams, my hopes, my expectations, my everything. They deferred me four months. And I just didn't know what to think. And I realized that I was hurting in the present, but I'm going to hurt a lot in the future, too. They just set a precedent, a precedent that really hurts. So to think that only the present, present matters? No, there is far more to the world than the present. There is the future. And sometimes we've got to set a precedent for the future. So now I want you to imagine this buff Indian man. Now let me just tell you, this buff Indian man is me. <laughs> As you may guess, this buff Indian man isn't so buff. Actually, I have a BMI of 33.7. Basically, you know what that means. It means I'm a beast. And what this does is something very profound. Because it means that by the time I'm 40, I will be dead. So, lesson learned, I cannot live in the present, because if I do, I will be dead in a couple of years. So my mother realized this, and she told me the present isn't the only thing that matters. You, my boy, are getting a personal trainer. <laughs> now, his name is Jonel. Now, I hope you do, don't be seduced by his name. He's actually a very mean man. He whips out his belt, and he whips me into shape. He makes me do these 
these repetitive motions repetitively, surprisingly, and what he does is he leaves me with my deltoids in pain, my biceps in pain, my triceps in pain, my hamstrings in pain. I'm not even a biologist and I now know what this means. Fantastic. But the thing is, is that even as much as I hate, even as much now I can tell my friends who say, bro, you lift? Yeah, I lift. Now I lift more than textbooks. <laughs> but I realize in the future, I will be buff, and I will be able to get the ladies, and I will have a healthy life, and I will be great. And I realize that I can't just live in the present, I gotta live in the future, because I, I don't want to be dead when I'm 40. I want to be living and having a wife and kids and little me's. Fantastic. <laughs> My own life, but there are people who care more about the future on a far greater scale. And this is a man called Peter Sun who runs this website called Pirate Bay. Now, I I'm sure most of you know what it is, but for those of you that don't, let's examine the words Pirate Bay, and you may be able to think that it is about piracy. And basically, in, pi in the Pirate Bay, you can get a couple of things like free movies, free PDFs, inappropriate things as well, but don't go there. It's basically the dark side of the internet. But what Pirate Bay has done is something profound. What Peter Sun has done is something very, very profound. Because he's challenged the notion that intellectual property rights are the only things that matter. He has taken us and he has created a future in which we will realize that maybe information will be more ubiquitous. He's really challenged us and cared for our future generations. My little me's will not only be buffed, but they'll be able to get anything they want for free. That's fantastic. And that's, I mean, that's honestly really great. But we see more than just Peter Sun and how he's really set a precedent where he's really challenged Hollywood. He's actually inspired me to be a rebel, to fight against the system. Because maybe you know about chemistry class. In chemistry class, you are required to wear shoes at all times. Because there are acids, it's hydrochloric acid, phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, carbon monoxide, annoying other chemistry students, all of that stuff is present in chemistry class. But one day, I refused to allow my British teacher to tell me what to do. I will wear slippers, and I will not let you make me do what you want. This is my system, not yours. I will set a precedent for future Indian kids to not be colonized once more under your oppressive <laughs> slippers, I took two shirts and I wrapped them around my slippers and made shirt shoes. Fantastic. He sent me to the vice principal along with the bullies, cyber bullies, sexual harassers, and all of that other stuff. It was a very insightful experience. But I've set a precedent. I will not allow myself to be dictated by the press. I don't care about the future Indians, the future little me's, everyone. So whether it's me and working out, that's right, eat your son, or whether it's me with my chemistry shoes, I believe the future is important not just the present.